Delhi NCR has now replaced cities such as Bangalore and Mumbai as the startup hub of the country. In addition to housing the largest number of active startups, Delhi NCR leads in the number of unicorns. It has the highest cumulative private market valuation with three out of four most valuable internet companies driving their businesses from the city. Discussing this panel with us, we have Rajneesh Arora, Chief Innovative and Strategy Officer, Spice Money, who will also be moderating this panel, Rishi Mehra, Chief Executive Officer, Wishfin.com, Gaurav Chopra, Founder and Chief Executive Officer, India Lens, Samir Agarwal, Founder and Chief Executive Officer, Refwin, Ankit Bhargava, Founder and Chief Executive Officer, Zenpay Solutions Private Limited. Over to you, Rajneesh. The stage is all yours. Thank you. Hi, uh, welcome everyone uh, joining us virtually and a very warm welcome to our esteemed panel. Thank you. Uh, we witnessed some very interesting sessions uh, earlier today, uh, ranging from regulation and, you know, impact of 5G on the fintech industry. We also had a fireside chat with uh, Sonu, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, I'm honored to be moderating this session where we're going to talk about uh, our very own Delhi's role in India's fintech boom. Last five years, we've seen a phenomenal rise in the uh, number of fintech startups in the country, uh, ranging from payments to lending to wealth tech, insure tech, all of them. According to a report uh, by BCG, uh, the fintech sector in India is expected to be valued in excess of $150 billion. And Delhi is leading the pack. You know, as we heard, Delhi, is now, uh, Delhi now has the largest number of active uh, fintech startups, leaving behind Bangalore and Mumbai. Will this trend continue? What is making Delhi kick are some of the questions that we'll ponder upon today. Uh, before we begin, uh, let's have a quick round of introductions. Uh, maybe I'll start and then I'll hand it over to you, Rishi, and we'll go one by one. Uh, my name is Rajneesh Arora. Uh, my role is to drive innovation and strategy at Spice Money. In the last 25 years of my career, I've been very fortunate to be part of, uh, you know, the early stages of birth of new sectors in the country. So starting from telecom in the late 90s uh, to organize retail in the early 2000 to, uh, you know, e-commerce and now fintech. Before Spice Money, I founded a, a startup in the B2B e-commerce space. Spice Money, of course, is, you know, one of the most exciting and uh, satisfying, you know, roles for me. Uh, rarely do you get a chance to run a business and impact millions of lives. And I'm humbled by the fact that Spice Money uh, does exactly that, you know. Uh, with monthly transacting customers in excess of 20 million, processing transactions worth one and a half billion dollars every month, it just seems like a beginning and miles to go. Uh, when it comes to rural, I mean, Spice Money is actually a rural fintech. And when it comes to rural, there are very unique nuances. Okay. Not just geographically, but, you know, uh, culturally, the beliefs uh, that exist there, the infrastructure, all of them. And to be able to solve such problems needs a grounds up approach. And that's exactly what I enjoy at Spice Money. Uh, Rishi? Yeah, hi. Thank you. Uh, this is Rishi Mehra. I'm currently a founder and CEO of Wishfin.com. Started my career, uh, I'm a, uh, basically a tech background guy. I started my career in transportation and warehouse optimization. Uh, started a company in early 2000s which helped uh, revolutionize how trucking and operations used to happen across on that front. Uh, 2006 and 7, uh, I sold it to a company, to a listed company, etc. on that front. 
Uh, then I started another company, Evolve Technologies, in which we were solving problems of how X-ray imaging to other various problems. These were all machine-based uh, programs where we, what we tried to do was change how uh, technology was used across on that, how the ecosystems were built around that. Uh, interestingly, in 2013-14, the whole idea uh, of fintech uh, came into our structures where we wanted to solve problems of humans of managing credit and, uh, you know, and wishes. So the whole idea of wishfin.com came across. We said people have wishes and there's finance that needs to be managed. So what we thought was people have either realistic goals and there is a credit that they have to manage. So we, we wanted to have a constructive role where we want to give people the understanding which wishes they can convert into real goals and how they can manage across to a credit. Uh, so in our platform, we help consumers take right responsible decisions in terms of credit uh, lending and then even helping them to take insurance and uh, mutual fund as a product across. Uh, uh, in the current setup, we, we help uh, disperse more than 300 crores of loans from through our portal at this period of time monthly numbers. We help large numbers in terms of uh, acquiring customer and opting for the right insurance product in the mutual funds. That's me. Over to Gaurav. Thanks, Rishi. Hi, I'm uh, Gaurav Chopra. I'm the founder of India Lens. I've uh, spent the last 16, 17 odd years working in the consumer lending space, uh, mostly on the consumer unsecured side. Started my career working with a Capital One Bank uh, based out of the London office. Was there for about eight or nine years and then moved back to India. Uh, worked for uh, a startup in the P2P lending space. Uh, was a part of the founding team of uh, Geo, and then started India Lens uh, in 2015. India Lens is essentially looking at uh, solving the demand and supply side of unsecured consumer lending. Uh, so we do three things. Uh, one is we help uh, banks and BFCs, uh, P2P companies and fintechs uh, source new customers. Uh, uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, providing unsecured uh, uh, consumer loans and cards. Uh, the second thing is uh, we help other consumer companies uh, generate more revenues by offering uh, their customers loans uh, via our APIs. Uh, and the third is uh, uh, we also do uh, risk sharing and lending on our side uh, in partnership with the selected few banks and NBFCs, uh, all with the aim of helping consumers uh, find the best possible uh, lending deals, uh, which means uh, you know the most optimal ticket size for them, as well as uh, the best interest rates uh, in the most optimized uh, manner. Uh, that's about me. Thank you. Over to Samir. Thanks, Gaurav. Hi, I'm Samir Agarwal. I'm the founder of Refin. Uh, I've worked as a banker and in consumer lending for 15 years. Uh, spent about a decade with HSBC in the UK. Uh, then did a short stint with a London-based startup working with uh, uh, the subprime sector in, in, in the UK. And then uh, that kind of gave uh, the or put the idea in my mind to st uh, start my own venture. So decided to come back to India about three, three and a half years back uh, to start Refin. Uh, the primary idea behind Refin is, uh, was to create a digital lending platform that could underwrite any individual, irrespective of whether they had past credit history or not, irrespective of their education, geography, or uh, whether they had banking transactions or not. Um, as a business, we focused a lot on financing in the electric three-wheeler space, mostly in the small commercial vehicle space. Uh, we've been doing that for the last three years, and uh, we'll continue to scale in that segment. Over to you, Ankit. Thank you, Samir. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ankit Bhargav. I'm representing Zenpay Solutions. I have worked in almost uh, for two decades into banking industry. I worked with HSBC, Yes Bank, Kotak, HDFC. Worked for multiple departments, be it foreign exchange, retail banking, corporate salary, business banking. Uh, before starting Zenpay, uh, I was a complete banker where I was handling a lot of departments. With Zenpay Solutions, uh, we, we, I saw a big gap which is there in the banking industry when I was in a banking stint. Uh, uh, there's a big gap in terms of uh, corporate salary accounts which are available between the informal sector and, uh, and the banks. The salary accounts are not available for the informal sector. Uh, a lot of a lot of informal lot of people are getting paid in cash in the in, in the informal sector and the salary account solutions are not reaching to them 
that's the reason and, and some interesting facts uh, which I want to share with, with the audience uh, that in the informal sector, uh, when I talk about the informal sector, I, I was talking about the blue collared workforce, the SMEs, the MSMEs, uh, the employees working in the manufacturing units. Uh, in India, almost 50 crore of the people are being categorized as a blue collared workforce. And almost 60% of the population in India is still unbanked. Keeping all these things in mind, which you know focuses us or motivate us to build a solution, build a product, which can be uh, offered to as a salary account for the in the informal sector, uh, which can actually add values in their lives, and hence we started Zenpay Solutions with the aim of revolutionizing the entire informal uh, sector space. When when we are starting our uh, proposition in Zenpay. We are very well, uh, you know, uh, un we are very well no focused, and we are we are very well known that we are uh, will be creating a big revolution in the in the particular space. Since uh, we are trying to build a solution for the informal sector, for the blue collar workforce, where their salaries are involved, it's very important for us to build a solution which is very very transparent, which is very easy to use, uh, since most of our population. Most of our target audience, the huge target audience is, is unbanked and they are using the account for the first time. So it has to be a cost effective as well. So keeping all these things in mind, we have taken a year, a complete year to design our product and solutions. We have, we have, we have taken a deep uh, understanding of the market before launching the product. Uh, two years back, we launched our product uh, uh, with, with, within, within Delhi NCR. We have reached our horizon for two, for, from Delhi NCR to almost nine states now. Uh, we have onboarded around 1,50,000 customers. Yesterday, we have completed 500 crores of the transaction volume. We are educating our customers on the usage of bank accounts because most of them are the, are the customers are, uh, you know, are una are not, have not used the bank accounts previously. So it's very important for us to make them understand on the usage of bank accounts. So we, we are bridging the gap between the banks, between the financial institutions and the people working in the informal space so that they can get themselves included in the financial inclusion. So we are, we are building a product which can actually add values in their lives, which can change their lives through which they can, they can utilize a lot, lot of the financial products which are available for them. So that's all about Zenpe. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ankit. So let's begin our discussion uh, by talking in brief about uh, you know, the origin of your business, the challenges that you faced, and uh, if you got support from the local ecosystem, from Delhi's ecosystem. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, so you know, the, the basic idea where uh, you have to uh, uh, you know, uh, teach consumers how to manage credit and how to ensure whatever they wish, which is right for them. I think was the basic idea which had uh, too much variations in that and how to put it into a UI UX in, uh, structure and make a customer understand was the first basic challenge. And then to have onboarded institutions which want a uh, customer, uh, which don't just want to lend to a customer, but make him understand that he's taking this credit and how he should responsibly give it for that. Uh, so that was the first challenge uh, that needs to be, uh, you know, spoken to the banks. This is not about selling of loans. It's about also making a customer understand what is the right credit across. So that was the first challenge. Yes, uh, institutions came forward. There was a, a lot of help uh, when you try to solve a real problem from consumers. Because in India, there are only 8 to 9 crore of people which actually uh, have, a, you know, which are income tax paying people and from if you are not able to teach them how to manage credit so you will have a large part of population fall out into bad credit zones and then eventually everything fail around on that system but so but that was the initial challenge uh, happy to see a lot more people know more about credit uh, we were the first to uh, bring in india the credit bureau report that's a civil report in india uh, we, we we did that for consumers for free to understand that uh, and we got a lot more uh, help from organizations which wanted to understand this space and cross on that front. Yeah. Yeah, I can uh, uh, touch upon, you know, support that we received from uh, other entities, other people. So I think uh, uh, when I uh, started India Lens, you know, fintech wasn't really a term that time. And, uh, you know, the demand and supply side of things was obviously there. 
uh, but being a first time founder you know uh, i thought it is good to get support from people who've been in the industry uh, both on the finance side and on the technology side so I was very blessed to you know uh, meet uh, good advisors uh, from the banking space uh, uh, so got them on board as advisors uh, took support from them then got a lot of support from the ecosystem as well uh, was you know a part of the microsoft startups uh, team uh, we got uh, into the google uh, accelerator program uh, which was a uh, you know year long uh, program with you know uh, three odd weeks in the san francisco campus uh, where there was uh, in depth training on the on the tech user experience side uh, and then along the way you know uh, as we got investors on board got a lot of support from uh, them and uh, you know got in touch with other uh, experienced people who helped us on the way so uh, that would also be my advice to you know people looking to start new uh, you know uh, get smart people not only on your team but on your advisory panel as well and uh, make the most from their knowledge right okay uh, so uh, so i had a slightly different journey because i was uh, i moved from the uk to set up my venture over here so i never had a uh, never had the opportunity to work in india and to uh, build professional relationships in india um, and and that proved a little bit tricky initially uh, the good thing was that uh, before i started i had the opportunity of meeting a few fintech entrepreneurs uh, including gaurav uh, and uh, it was comforting to see that there was already an existing fintech setup in india which had been booming for the last 2 3 years it was very encouraging and motivating in fact uh, kind of help me make a decision that you know this is a uh, it's 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 a good decision to come back to india and start my own venture uh, i think uh, i would say that uh, i mean of course you know as you are starting up a lot of people uh, you you meet a lot of people along the way a lot of them help you uh, but you know some of them actually have a huge impact in the way uh, you do things and how you make decisions uh, when i was coming back to india uh, everybody was absolutely opposed to me coming back right leaving a nice job in the uh uk uh living in an apartment over looking thames it's very difficult god of you you, <laughs> yes, you, you know that <laughs> um, but there was one particular entrepreneur uh, uh, who actually uh, really uh, helped me uh, convince myself that i can do it and i'm very fortunate that the person sitting right next to me uh, so he's very instrumental in me coming back and setting up my own venture in india so thank you gorov and then uh, once i started then of course a lot of people helped me Uh, i could see that uh, you know once i had committed uh, everybody who said don't come back said this is the right decision and we'll support you a lot of people helped me along the way my father has been my biggest supporter and he was the one who was saying there's absolutely no way you're coming back uh, right so i think a lot of people have helped along the way of course then uh, when i started building my teams uh, i'm very fortunate that some of my uh, founding team members are still with us in the company for the last 3 3 and a half years a uh, big big uh, support to me as well Yeah. much for me yeah. so uh, gorav uh, you know you got a lot of support from you know like you said google accelerator and you know do you think there's something in delhi that that will is there something sustainable in delhi that makes it a startup destination or a hot destination uh, is the delhi ecosystem you feel is is supporting it or you know it's it's probably just a matter of chance or what is it that is making delhi the hottest startup hub what what do you think yeah see um, my view is see delhi being the capital has its uh, you know own advantages mm. uh, but more so from a fintech st- standpoint i would say uh, you know mumbai is the hub for uh, finance uh, bangalore is the hub for technology and delhi sits right in between where we have you know a mix of both mm-hmm. right so all if you ask any financial institution Uh, their biggest presence after mumbai would be delhi right so that that helps uh, uh, in in terms of you know getting uh, the right talent uh, the regulator is based out of delhi uh, that also helps in terms of uh, technology i would say that you know compared to uh, uh, bangalore and many other geographies it is uh, uh, i find that the talent is more sticky here uh, attrition is lower uh, last year has been uh, bad with you know some Uh, newer companies coming and offering uh, higher salaries and all but otherwise we've seen uh, it, i can give my example that most of my uh, founding tech team has been with us for the last 5 6 years and uh, you know we uh, continue to hire good talent and uh, i think combination of that makes uh, delhi a good geography right 
Uh, anything to add here? Uh, See, uh, uh, I would like to add as a Delhi is becoming uh, the hub for the fintechs. So we have we are we all have seen that there is a high surge in banks and fintechs to serve the you know unbanked population of the country. We have seen a lot of fintech organizations are coming in. You know, working for tier two and tier three cities, people in the tier two and tier three cities working for the unbanked population, and being a northern India, almost fifty percent of the people, fifty percent of the India's population is there in northern India. States like UP, Bihar, you know, uh, Uttarakhand, uh, Madhya Pradesh, majority of the unbanked population are still there. In these states, still the financial inclusion has not reached to the last mile. Delhi, Delhi being the central area and an easily approachable area for these people, and the, all the all the states which I mentioned have a common culture. All the people in these states share a common culture, and Delhi has a you know capability of adapting the different cultures at the same time. So it's become easy for the you know startups for the for the for the fintech organizations who are willing to work for the unbanked population, who are willing for the larger you know population to establish there and build the product as per the customer needs. Customers also feel very secure that the people are there in Delhi, that they are the companies that you are working with are based out of Delhi. So they can relate themselves easily, which will help, you know, which is helping Delhi to become a next financial or a next fintech hub for the for the entire country. Yeah. Yeah, there's another thing that a lot of these tech companies had a larger base in Noida, uh, Gurgaon, uh, which were initially started in the 90s, main in HCL, main in Tech Mahindra. Uh, and stuff like that. So there's a lot of tech talent which started originating by these service agent companies which were servicing clients in the US and UK. They had these talent available and then to migrate them to, into a product industry, it was easier to run across on that front. That's my point of view. Yeah, very interesting actually. So, so you're saying uh, availability of talent, right? And uh, Ankit, you're making the point that the market is here, right? The underserved market which is prime for fintech. Yes is actually sitting here and understanding the customer is the key here. Right? Correct, correct. Understanding right. the customer, making the product as per the culture of the customer Absolutely. is very important. So that very the customer can relate themselves to the product and start using those financial products and become comfortable with those products. Right, right. And you know, when it comes to talent, uh, you know, uh, one of you said, uh, you know, Delhi sits in the middle of both. Right, like there is financial institutions in Mumbai, right? You will find people from domain there and technology you will find Bangalore. I mean, does Delhi sit in the middle or it doesn't sit anywhere? I mean, is this, do you really, you know, is there a talent crunch here? Is, is there a view that any of us are taking there? I, I have experienced to some extent that in my past experience. Earlier it was there, earlier it was there was a talent crunch. But if you see, see in Mumbai, in Bangalore, if you see 50% of the population are from Northern India only. The techies are from Northern India. They have moved from here to there because of the, because of the technology, because of the technology companies are not there right now. Now what I have seen what, or I have observed people are willing to come back since the, you know, Northern India, the Delhi is becoming the fintech hub, financial, uh, the technology companies are coming up, uh, the startups are coming up, people are willing to come back. So talent was talent crunch was earlier there, but in our, in our coming days, in the coming times, I don't see a talent crunch to be there in Delhi and CR. People are willing to come back with the kind of uh, you know fintech boom which is coming in Delhi, fintech role. The, the Delhi is witnessing a fintech role, the fintech age, basically. Mm. So it helps you know, you know attracting a lot of talents coming back to the northern region. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah this another point of view I have is that uh, see for a regular tech, uh, Delhi has a lot of talent. I mean. The, which, which we call as, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, doing everyday work at the tech side and the, the number of people that you have is high. Uh, what you, what I would have a view is that, uh, you know, uh, if you're asking for somebody who is highly tech, I mean, high grade tech that you're looking at, that mm -hmm. is something that is a little less available in Delhi compared to what you can get in Bangalore for so short. So mm -hmm. that average tech availability, because of what I was mentioning earlier, there is that availability across over a period of time. There are institutions available. You have, you know, the largest, uh, the IITs in Delhi, et cetera, et cetera, which innovates in a lot of engineering colleges in Delhi. Uh, so that w provided uh, us a good quality talent in to start with. But over the years, the good quality talent moves down where, uh, you know, where there is more innovation, where there is uh, more culture. So Bangalore, they moved out, as he's mentioned across. Uh, but uh, eventually, home is home. Uh, 
right? Some people <laughs> yeah. come back across. A lot of us are here because it's home, right? right? So that's why we will build anything out from here, whatever it takes. Great, right? Yeah, right. Uh, do you think uh, investors, when it comes to funding, investors care about where you are situated these days? I mean. And has it changed like after pandemic because everything is becoming so virtual? After pandemic, uh, the see, location is not a barrier which I see. Uh, but the, yes, uh, I, I feel that still we, 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 Delhi has to witness the fund houses, the investors to focus, you know, to, to take away the barrier which, which, which they have. Almost 50% of the fund houses and investors are sitting in Mumbai or in Bangalore. And they feel comfortable with the, you know, startups or the fintech companies sitting there. It, it gets, it, they, they, they can easily get in touch with them. So yes, it was there, but what I see now, maybe in future, maybe in coming months, there's a huge shift of the investors coming, the, the focus is coming towards Delhi. Uh, since the location is not, not going to be a barrier, we have seen the, you know, in the pandemic times, the location is not a barrier, people are working from home, they are easy, very much comfortable in working from home. So yes, but the shift has to happen, you know, towards Delhi, the focus has to come towards Delhi where they feel comfortable, they feel, you know, the fund houses, the investors, uh, you know, uh, come here and, you know, start investing in the businesses rather than the focus area of, you know, towards Bangalore or in Mumbai. Samir, any outside in perspective, you've come in fresh, do you so, see investors uh, there care about? So I think, uh, I think uh, there is a bit of uh, uh, what Ankit is saying, which is that, you know, if you are present, if you can meet physically, uh, that does give some level of comfort. Uh, from a lending perspective, since we are in the lending space, uh, you know, I think of investors both in terms of equity and debt. Um, and uh, even on the debt side, most of the uh, uh, major banks and BFC set out of Mumbai. And over there, I think the whole concept of meeting, seeing your office, seeing the board in front of the office, you know, all those things are important. Uh, I think on that side, there is definitely a, there is a, a a significant impact of not being co-located. Equity side, uh, I mean, I have not personally experienced that. Uh, I think there is a little bit of obviously uh, being close is always good. Mm -hmm. I think Delhi does need to have a lot more uh, uh, private equity or venture capital sitting out of Delhi, having their main offices in Delhi. I think that's missing. I think that needs to happen. That will evolve over a period of time. Uh, but I think, uh, frankly, I mean, you know, if your business is good, if it's scalable, then there's no barrier. Yeah, beyond a point, actually, yeah. all lines get blurred. Right? Yeah, I mean, you know, taking uh, a step back to your broader question, I would uh, say, you know, Delhi, Bombay, uh, Bangalore are uh, probably, you know, uh, on the same lines. Problem is probably on the, uh, you know, other metropolitans or tier two cities. Mm -hmm. so if you uh, look at overall uh, investments that have come in, uh, these uh, three cities would probably account for a majority uh, of them. And the reason is not that we don't have uh, talent in other cities or they're not startups in other cities. It comes to access. So, you know, mm -hmm. most of your uh, uh, VCs, uh, whether they be early stage uh, uh, or, you know, going to the PE stage as well, uh, would have a presence in all these three cities. Uh, and, and that does make a lot of difference. The whole, you know, uh, meeting uh, in-person point that, uh, you know, the, the team here mentioned uh, does come into play. Yeah. See, for a venture capital or anybody to start invest, uh, they need some some time to spend with uh, the founders and the team, etc. Mm. So being in that place, having an office and being able to walk in and understand a little bit more and have that, uh, you know, warm body touch, you know, it helps a little bit on that front. But eventually, as Vitton mentioned, if your business is good, product is good, nothing else matters. Right, right, right. Okay, let's talk about, uh, you know, what we've been witnessing uh, in general, right? So taking, putting the consumer in the center, right? There is a paradigm shift in the way they are purchasing and the way they're paying, right? I mean, and the pandemic just, just kind of made a radical shift there, right? Uh, and I think it was more of a compulsion also, right? To, to basically just do things digitally, right? When everything closed down. Uh, when we come to, you know, the smaller towns, right? Like where, for example, Spice Money is present. It's not a natural shift, okay? Uh, how do you guys see this? Is it a challenge? Is it, an, is it an opportunity? How you been dealing with, you know, getting a certain segment to, you know, adopt digital, right? So Samir, you, yeah. you know? So maybe I'll answer some yeah. of, uh, part of that. Uh, so 75% of our customers come from tier three towns. Um, 
and what we've experienced during the pandemic is basically the reverse of digitalization right so most of our uh, customer payments used to come through digital uh, me uh, means prior to the pandemic i think post pandemic uh, people are kind of holding on to their money themselves rather than depositing them in the banks um, and uh, and they've moved towards more cash payments rather than digital payments so i think i think uh, so that's a reverse shift that we've seen uh, i think it's to, a lot to do with uh, education but also about trust people don't trust that that money is going to remain safe in the bank people don't trust that uh, you know there'll not be uh, too many bounce charges on emis and so on and so forth that's why they don't want to leave money in that account uh, so that trust and education needs to be built into the system uh, and uh, uh, also on the other hand you know uh, we see a shift in other behaviors right so certainly in their uh, let's say buying behavior we see a shift right people do one delivery is coming to the doorsteps now all right so hyper local deliveries etc are gaining a lot of momentum in small towns uh, but again that's primarily uh, the transaction money transactions are still primarily cash driven right so i mean that's what we are experiencing it's a it's i would say a a, a big issue because ultimately uh, even when we look at all the payments and uh, payment systems being used and payment transactions happening those are mainly happening in a few big cities right and i think uh, even uh, payment gateways payment firms now need to start reaching out uh, qr based uh, uh, both taking and giving money needs to start more broadly not just in 30 40 50 uh, big cities or tier 1 tier 2 cities but also in smaller places i think that shift needs to happen uh, and that needs to be done collectively between uh, uh, payment companies banks and people working with those segments people like us people like spice money i think we need to partner and create those uh, shifts in, uh, in in mindsets and behaviors so you're saying here and now you know cash is very much there right yeah, and I mean, it's a reality it is a reality i mean you know there's no denying that it is a reality uh, cities are doing away with cash and towns are kind of uh, you know the cash uh, transactions are higher uh, i think it's a huge opportunity uh, if i were a payment company i would see that as a large opportunity to go into those small towns and move out of uh, delhi and uh, bangalore and move into those small towns i think there's a huge opportunity sitting there uh, a lot of players people like us people like spice money are operating in these spaces uh, you know i'll give you my own example uh, when we started we wanted to kind of build that into our offering to the customer right we went to some of the largest payment companies and they said we don't operate there we have no intention of going there with you right so i think those things need to shift even though the opportunity may look small today but it can easily escalate and become a huge opportunity and and i think all of us are uh, quite digital in our approach so it's not that it's a huge cost pressure on going into newer geographies that needs to happen yeah yeah right um uh, got a view what have you seen you know urban versus small town especially during this you know shift See, uh, you know, there's no uh, doubting the fact that the whole smartphone, I mean, it's not a revolution anymore, right? It's a necessity mm -hmm. now. And uh, that is the start of uh, digitization. And combined with e-commerce, I think it is supporting all other industries that require digitization. Mm -hmm. So as long as you have a phone and, you know, you've done at least one transaction on an e-commerce website, I think all other industries, uh, whether it be delivery, whether it be uh you know lending whether it be payments uh, you know uh, over a period of time do follow and mm. we did see that in the pandemic uh, people applying uh, digitally for loans uh, doing their kyc online mm. uh, you know doing their uh, repayment mandates online so i you know if you were to take a you know maybe 18 months or a two year view i don't see any uh, reason why uh, digitization uh, will not come in in uh, you know these geographies also mm -hmm. rishi you you know you have products beyond lending right and uh, like insurance for example when everything was shut down yeah. did you see a yeah. surge yeah yeah and from where yeah so you know uh, if we, we talk about uh, you know the surge in investment in other products was yes see uh, there are a lot of people who were used to have a warm body touch and then invest or meet an advisor and then buy a life insurance mm. right uh, and pandemic came and there was uh, you know there was fear uh, 
to have a health insurance. There were fears of other things across. So people realized that they have to take up an insurance and it has to be done online. So they came and did the uh, necessary steps across on that front. And I also think the institutions, the large manufacturers, uh, they were taken aback, which they thought they were, uh, you know, uh, you know, they were tech companies in cell, but they realized that operation in the first lockdown, uh, you know, uh, affected them a lot across. They digitized very quickly. And in the second pandemic, uh, in the second wave of the pandemic, uh, there was not enough, uh, the people were, uh, or the large manufacturers were already uh, prepared to get these things going across on that front. So con from a consumer point of view, uh, they wanted these products because they had fear and they wanted to get these products. So they were online and they decided to buy online. Uh, but there were infrastructure in the first phase was not there. In the second phase, it was there. And it is, from my point of view, uh, what you see across in large banks, uh, financial institutions, insurance companies, the change has been humongous. And from a consumer point of view, they have now used to buying everything online. So they, they've realized that everything can come to home, everything can be bought, and the trust factor can be figured out by researching online across on the front. Right. And this you saw across the kinds of geographies? Yes. Uh, so for us, what we realized was that, see, uh, when the need comes to a product, right, uh, as you were talking about investment and insurance, right, the need has come to them where they can't go, mm. right? So there is a natural shift that I need a product, I have to get it done. So for, for that purpose, uh, all these tier two, tier three, tier four towns, which were earlier only banking on these small, uh, you know, you used to find, uh, you know, bank branch or an insurance branch. Uh, or a mutual fund uh, distributor branch across all these small shops, uh, you know, in, in tier two, tier three. Now you see them moving off and people are actually doing it online. So I see a lot more surge happened because of pandemic and also the manufacturing having the product to give you your two wheeler insurance instantly on your WhatsApp. Mm. Right. So that was that has changed a lot, you know, during this period of time. So that's I feel uh, it's the demand and the supply side both have accustomed to what the change that pandemic brought across. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Uh, anything you've uh, picked up, Ankit? See, uh, uh, see, the actual revolution for the fintechs happened, uh, started from demonetization. The digital uh, e era of, for India started with the, the, the demonetization happened. And pandemic, for, for what I see, the pandemic is act as a icing on the cake. For the for the fintechs for the digital uh, you know players to come up, uh, we have seen we have we all have seen we have all have witnessed that our parents take an example of our parents only before pandemic or before demonetization all of them are using have having a habit of using a cash they are making payments in cash but when the demonetization happened when the pandemic happens everybody has moved to a digital you know era of making payments everybody is very much okay in you know making payments through the through the QR through the digital medium which are available. Even on the you know on the on the shopping side as well, if you if you talk about uh, everybody is ordering online. Nobody was allowed to go here and there in the market. People are ordering online. Having everything is becoming you know on a digital platform. It is moving on, especially in tier two cities, especially in tier three cities, uh, where people are very much comfortable and adapting these you know digital spaces uh, in their regular habits. And since uh, like Gaurav uh, you know mentioned. The smartphone is not a luxury now. It's 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 a necessity now. So people are having a smartphone. They are willing to you know order rather than visiting on the you know stores, purchasing anything on the digital payment side. People are very much comfortable in making payments through the all the digital mediums which are available. Even for our sector, the informal sector, people are adapting those changes. A, a rapid change we have seen where the people are adapting those changes in making digital payments. They are not willing to make payments in cash. They are not willing to make you know rent payments or the food payments into a you know into a cash. Even the companies are not willing to pay their workers into cash. So yeah. Yeah. for me, the, there's a huge revolution which which pandemic the demonetization has set up for the country. So what I pick up is I think the general trend is of course you know smartphones are growing and pandemic has you know pushed people to that there's no other choice and I think the digitization across sectors we all know. Uh, but interesting point that Samir has pointed out is that he's seen something reverse. So I think it's about uh, probably the segments of uh, customers, the segments of borrowers, right? And 
what what is the problem they are facing and what is the approach needed to solve that right so i mean that's the point yeah. that you are making right yes so there is a general trend and then there are you know there are pockets. probably pockets which which generally are blind to us right because we live in a different world right so and sometimes we wear our own lens when we look at consumer right right correct uh, yeah so mixed realities here yeah i think i'll just I'll probably also share one sort of personal anecdote as well mm. so during the first lockdown i spent a couple of months in a small town in uttarakhand and in that town amazon doesn't do home delivery mm. you have to go to the town center to collect right and that's the reality of india right so it is happening but yeah. there's a, a little bit more to do mm. right okay okay so you know uh, we have three of our panelists uh, into you know hardcore into lending spaces so i would like to ask you guys uh, you know uh, how do you manage the demand and supply and especially during this whole uh, start and stop pandemic related scenario right uh, yeah. we all know the challenges so how you know tell us about your experience how you manage them and are you back on track or is there still a gap uh, rishi yeah uh, so what we see uh, on the demand and supply Uh, the numbers are back to what they were pre-COVID levels in terms of lending in India. Uh, I think they may be higher going this month forward for any one of us or for the banks and the institutions put together. Uh, I mean, whether they were distributors or whether they were suppliers across on that front. Uh, the challenges that you saw was the first wave. Uh, everything got shut. There was a whole distribution. The supply side got affected a lot. Uh, consumer side came back. uh across on that front as you you know we have to understand the life never stopped you know people have their needs uh yes wishes got installed for a period of time people started taking some decisions on something uh, which is uh, you know they not need and converted into a want they paused for a period of time and whenever it comes out and i mean whenever you know 3 months comes out people start buying in a frenzy so there is a pent up demand we saw heavily on the home loan side where people just bought homes in a in a very different format and people never thought in the first 3 months of pandemic that there was so much of a uh, sale uh, sale on the homes uh, on that front and then even from the clothing segment that we saw on the spending on the credit cards that we saw across as soon the wave subsides people go and spend out that's our natural habit right so we don't see any challenge coming forward and now when the institutions are in that place where they can uh, you know they do not want to meet the customer and give him a uh, lending based on meeting a customer and understanding him i think the problem has been solved at on that regards at both sides supply side and and the manufacturer giving the access to a customer to have a credit across that's my point of view yeah i think uh, you know rishi's obviously mentioned uh, overall industry trends uh, i would just add uh, that you know during the beginning of the pandemic uh, Uh, on the supply side uh, as there was a lockdown over there collections weren't happening at this point you know uh, from a creditor standpoint new acquisitions are normally put on hold and we saw that so you know when you were you would talk to any lender uh, big or small their focus would be that how do we manage our existing portfolio and uh, you know uh, most i would say good lenders put a break on their uh, new lending Uh, so that was one trend we saw which uh, you know luckily has uh, reversed now on uh, the demand side uh, you know if you break it down into the salaried and the self employed uh, during the lockdown the salary demand actually went down as well and the reason for that is that most people who were getting their salaries were not spending the same amount of money that they were spending earlier uh, they were not going out to eat they were not spending on uh, petrol they were not uh, there were no you know festivities happening or weddings happening and there was no travel happening so your disposable income actually went up which meant that the uh, demand for loans also went down uh, self employed was very different uh, these were people you know who uh, required money and unfortunately uh, because of lack of uh, supply uh, you know they had to either uh, settle for lower amounts or had to pay much higher interest rates uh, uh, but luckily all this is now behind us yeah so you're saying uh is it back uh, for you as well gorav in terms of both the demand and the supply or there is a gap still see there is a gap i uh, so i wouldn't say that uh, both demand and supply are back uh, from a demand standpoint the uh, salaried class demand is uh, you know more or less back but uh, like i said you know people earlier used to borrow for a family vacation to europe 
or their kids were going abroad to study so they would you know borrow for that or there's a wedding in the family so they would uh, borrow for that all these things have been postponed now right so this will come back over time uh, but you know borrowing in these segments is not happening uh, mm -hmm. borrowing is happening now for uh, home renovations last uh, you know year and a half people didn't spend on uh, renovating the houses because they they weren't allowing people to come in now with that opening up people are spending their uh, they are upgrading uh, from a let's say from a 2 bhk to a 3 bhk so putting in that rental deposit uh, is is another uh, need uh, then this whole uh, you know leisure consciousness uh, of you know life uh, needs to be fulfilled today as opposed to you know only save and spend later so people are uh, spending on gadgets they are borrowing for that uh, so that is where uh, the demand has come back supply is still uh, I wouldn't say it's back to 100%. Uh, it may be in certain segments, right? So if today you ask a big bank, they'll be like, yes, I'll, I'm willing to uh, lend to somebody who's earning a good salary, working in the top 200 companies. Uh, but otherwise, there is still a question mark that, you know, what if a third wave comes? What if these people are not able to earn the same amount of money and in turn, you know, repay the loans? So uh, in those segments, uh, either the interest rate has uh, climbed uh, or like I said, the underwriting criteria has become uh, stricter, which means, you know, the ticket sizes have reduced uh, or, uh, you know, the paperwork required has uh, increased. Right? A very simple example, we had a huge segment of lending, which was uh, predicting the income of the borrower using the credit bureau score, uh, which meant that, you know, the borrower didn't have to uh, give a bank statement. Uh, I would say that segment is uh, down by nearly 80%, right? So there is uh, hardly any lending happening without looking at uh, a person's ability to, uh, you know, borrow uh, directly from his bank statements. So Gaurav, uh, I mean, then does it mean, you know, we've like gone back years in terms of the way we look at lending and credit and the way we look at customer? No, not at all. I, I would say we've, uh, you know, the overall uh, pandemic has taught us to move to more digital means. So if I look at, uh, you know, the average revenue that, uh, you know, my company was making per employee, uh, that number has uh, doubled, if not more, right? Mm -hmm. So we have moved to uh, digital processes. We moved to paperless things. Uh, the agent or the manual intervention is more uh, advisory where if somebody is stuck, uh, in a loan application uh, or wants to understand the loan terms more uh, is being used as opposed to, you know, for generating the sale. So I think these are all things that will uh, only help us to move to a more uh, digital lending space, similar to, you know, what we've witnessed in the insurance business, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Ten years back, travel insurance involved sending your passport, your tickets, and then, you know, two days later you would get your travel insurance. Now it's a click of a button. So uh, in lending also, you know, uh, I think in many segments we are doing that today. Uh, overall, over the next few months, we should see more and more segments opening up to that. Uh, but from a customer perspective, you know, you mentioned, you know, uh, lenders have, you know, clamped down on the kind of, the type of underwriting, ticket sizes, etc. So does it mean that, you know, a larger set is now excluded? See, lending is always a cyclical business, right? And uh, in, in lending, cycles are not, uh, uh, you know, are not just economic cycles. They were you know, the last recession in 2008, then demonetization, then the whole ILFS crisis. So these are times when lenders do pull back and these are right reasons to pull back. You know, they're not sure of the quality of the book they're building, but uh, very soon they do come back as well. And not only do those lenders come back, we also see that new lending institutions get set up. Uh, because to be honest, if you don't have a baggage of a book, uh, you know, uh, it's it's a green space, and uh, you want to uh, you know build a good book. Then. Sure, Gaurav. I am being told that we are running out of time. So, Sameer, very very quickly, if you could just give us a brief about yeah. your understanding. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, my views are quite similar. I mean, we've experienced similar things. Uh, last year, obviously, the demand was almost not there. The supply was also non-existent. Collections were very weak. This year, January onwards, we started seeing an increase in demand and uh, collections as well. Uh, it got back by March, it was back to pre-pandemic level. Uh, then again, the second wave started. We saw a slight dip. It wasn't a very big dip. It wasn't very long lasting, but for a short duration of time. And now uh, in the last two months, July, August, we've done more lending than we did all of last year. So it's looking good. Great, thank you. So uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Rishi, Gaurav, uh, Samir and Ankit. And thanks a lot. Uh, to the audience for 
joining us today. पांच मिनट में अकाउंट सेटअप और ट्रेडिंग शुरू हाँ कर सकते हैं नहीं कर सकते लगी शर्त और हारा तो It's possible with Coin Switch Kuber. Download karo aur Bitcoin trading start karo. Coin Switch Kuber. Sikka chamkega. Cryptocurrency is an unregulated digital asset, not a legal tender, and subject to market risks and price fluctuations. Where there is life, there is hope, there is meaning. But life has its downs, as much as its ups. Life is about challenges. Life is about opportunities. Time for joy, time for celebration, and time to introspect. Thankfully, in every one of life's moments, and even beyond life itself, there's LIC. Where there is life, there's always LIC. Zindagi ke saath bhi, zindagi ke baad bhi.